Good morning, church. This is Pastor Lisa, and welcome to worship. Next Sunday, we will be having virtual communion, so please have your elements ready. If you live in Patoka, you may contact Janet, and she can get you the pre-filled cups. As if you live in Farina, you can contact Carol, and she has uh, the pre-filled cups for here in town. Uh, that's all the announcements that I have. <clears throat> Let us pray. Merciful and patient God, how we must try your patience. We rush through the seasons of our lives as though we had a mighty schedule to keep. We plot out our days minute by minute, crowding each moment with tasks, stresses, and pressures. And we begin to notice the growing darkness and anxiety in our lives. We proclaim boldly each year that we will not let ourselves get so caught up in commercial pressures and demands, and yet, here we are, back in the same old trap, not enough time, not enough energy, and the very plans we weave becomes bonds which imprison us. Help us bind ourselves to you, loving God. Help us slow down and reflect on the many ways that you bless us. Let us drink deeply of your peace. Remind us again of the most precious gift of all, the gift of loving relationships between you and your creation. May we cherish the people and the peaceful moments you offer to us as we've lifted you, as we have lifted before you our joys and concerns in our hearts and in our minds. So lift our spirits to remember that you are always with us, offering your healing touch. You are always there. You offer your compassionate care. Help us to pay attention to the many ways in which you enrich our lives, O oh God. It has become far too easy for us to focus on the negative. We seem trapped in its spidery strands. This morning we celebrate the beginning of the Advent season, the coming of the Holy One. But before we can begin the celebration, we have to acknowledge where we have fallen short. We need to change our attitude of defiance to visions of cooperation. Be with our families, friends, and neighbors who suffer from illness, sorrow, alienation, marginalization, abuse, and fear. Bring healing and peace to their lives and their souls. Be with our families, our friends, and our neighbors who are experiencing great joy and happiness. May their spirits rejoice in all those good moments and in your great gifts. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 64, 1-9 If only you would tear open the heavens and come down. Mountains would quake before you like fire igniting brushwood or making water boil. If you would make your name known to your enemies, the nations would tremble in your presence. When you accomplished wonders beyond all our expectations, when you came down, mountains quaked before you. From ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God but you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You look after those who gladly do right. They will praise you for your ways. But you were angry when we sinned. You hid yourself when we did wrong. You have all become like the unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a menstrual rag. All of us wither like a leaf. Our sins, like the wind, carry us away. No one calls on your name. No one bothers to hold on to you. For you have hidden yourself from us, and we have handed us and have handed us over to our sin. But now, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. All of us are the work in your hand. Don't rage so fiercely, Lord. Don't hold our sins against us forever, but gaze now on your people. All of us. Mark 13, 24 through 37. In those days after the suffering of the time, the sun will become dark and the moon won't give its light. 
the stars will fall from the sky and the planets and other heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then we will see the human one coming in the clouds with great power and splendor. And then he will send the angels and gather together his chosen people from the four corners of the earth, from the ends of the earth to the end of heaven. If ever there was a year we needed Advent, this is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is nothing seems right. Nothing seems like it used to be. Nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us, Oh, that you would tear open the heaven and come down to make your name known, so that nations might tremble at your presence. So tear through the mess, O Lord, and come down to us again. We long to be your people, a people of hope. We light this first candle as a sign of our hope. Hope that you can meet us, even in the mess of our world. Hope that you still see us, though we feel we are lost in the rubble. Let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
It was scripture for readings for today. Come from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. A child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom, establishing and sustaining it with justice and righteousness now and forever. Our second scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 46 and 47, 52 through 55. Mary said, With all my heart, I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, and just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A Christmas carol is not your traditional feel-good Christmas story. And this is something that I'm going to be doing a sermon series on through the Advent season. This story begins with Marley. And it says Marley was dead. It's a pretty strange way to start out a holiday season, don't you think? But what, I mean, what goes better with Christmas than creepy ghosts, right? But the end of Ebenezer Scrooge's journey, we find that Scrooge had found a new life. It's an unconventional t hero's tale. So as odd as it may seem to start a Christmas story with the death, by all means, it makes perfect sense. At the beginning of the story on, on Christmas Eve, Scrooge is just as good as dead. His soul is as cold as the bleak midwinter air, and he goes on a difficult and frightening journey and eventually wakes up on Christmas morning a very changed man. A Christmas Carol is a timeless story, not only because we hear about Scrooge's past and present and future, but because generations have told and retold this, this story in their own way. And for over a hundred years now, A Christmas Carol has been part of our culture. It's a tale of redemption that will be with us for a long time to come. It's a story that's embedded itself into our culture, and for many of us, it's become a routine fixture in our holiday traditions. Everyone knows that what it means to be called Scrooge. And well, we always know that poor Tiny Tim always will pull on your heartstrings. And that dismissive saying, Bah humbug, perfectly expresses the world view of Ebenezer Scrooge, the tragic main character of our story. Scrooge is a sad man, and Christmas is not a happy time for him. But, to be fair, no time during the year seems to bring Scrooge too much joy. Scrooge is an iconic figure who represents stinginess and greed and generally being in a terrible mood. He's a testament to the negative image his name implies. Interestingly, though, Ebenezer is a Hebrew word meaning stone of help. In 1 Samuel 7:12, then Samuel took the stone and set it up between Mizpah and Jeshanah, and named it Ebenezer, explaining the Lord helped us to this very point. Maybe you remember singing about the sec about it in the second stanza of Come There Font of Every Blessing. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by the help I come. And even by the end of the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, we find he's a changed person. He, But he remains a strong caricature of everything Christmas celebration should not be. It seems we can't accept that he's been redeemed. But maybe there's still hope. Maybe by the end of the series, even Ebenezer Scrooge's name might come up to mean something very different for you. After all, Scrooge can be redeemed. Then we can too. The word Advent comes from the Latin word advenira, meaning to come. For four Sundays before Christmas, the church usually gathers to wait for the birth of the Christ child. During this time, we read the stories of the Old Testament from the prophets that God laid out the plan to send a Messiah 
to save God's people. And then we heard earlier the words from the prophet Isaiah. We are waiting on something that has already happened. And it's a pretty strange practice. The Advent season plays with our notion of time. The church gathers in the present to hear the stories from the past. To ponder the past so that we have a future hope. A Christmas carol is a beautiful story for the Advent season because it is a story where the past and the present and the future come together in one very life changing, one very transformative night. Certainly, it's about Scrooge's love for money and his unselfish failures, but it's a story about how Scrooge cannot let go of his past. Jesus came to save us from counting our past as our only reality. It's like when Moses led God's people out of out of the sla out of slavery into the wilderness, because living in the wilderness was difficult, and they were caught wandering between where they were and where they were going, and people complained and wished they had died as slaves. People become stubborn and bitter and almost Scrooge-like in their relationship with God and with one another. Instead of moving forward in faith and trusting that God was with them, the people kept looking over their shoulders, hopelessly lamenting over the way things were. Advent's like living in the wilderness between what was and what will be. Living into this tension, remembering God's promises and depending on faith, becomes spiritual disciplines that keep us from becoming Scrooges ourselves. Even though the promised land may seem far off, we hold tightly to the promises of our God. In Hebrews 10.23, let's hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, because the one who made the promises is reliable. So Advent, we spend four weeks waiting for Christ coming into the world. It's a strange thing to wait for something to happen that we know has already happened. It's already occurred. Some things you can only do once. You know, if you watch a football game, it's not the same if you already know who wins. And if you're reading a good mystery book, it's not nearly as good if you already know that the butler did it with the, in the ballroom with a candlestick. But Advent is very different. Christians profess that Christ was born, died, and rose again. And this big reveal has been made. But the church doesn't wait in expectation of what God is going to do. We live into the tension of where the divine meets the world, knowing what God has reconciled on all things through Christ. But the story's not finished yet. We have hymns and other religious songs that communicate our theology and our tradition and experience of God. In a large part, the music is the vehicle that the theology and tradition and the stories learn. Even if someone is not a Christian or knows the Christian tradition, they can probably finish the lyrics, Hark the herald angels sing glory to, or Silent Night. This is one of the reasons that Jesus spent so much time sp teaching through the stories we know as parables. The prodigal son reminds us of God's love and forgiveness. The good Samaritan urges us to offer compassion. And the sheep and the goat cautions us against forgetting the sick and the hungry and the imprisoned. And through Dickens' Christmas Carol is no longer, it is much longer than a parable. And it's not set to music. He uses the power of the story to remind us. There's no soul too gruff, too cold, too cantankerous for God's redeeming power. So as Scrooge is sleeping, his servant's bell over the door is ringing and ringing, and it woke Scrooge up from the sleep, and his dead partner, Jacob Marley's ghost, appears through the door, and he's weighed down by heavy chains, and they've been forged with his miserly wealth. And Marley says he's re restless, and he's always traveling with an incessant torture of remorse. Part of Marley's punishment was the inability to find peace, and his restlessness is one we know too well during the holidays. There's 
many times, and not this year, but most times there are parties and decorations, gifts, concerts. There are gifts to wrap, stockings to hang, or threaten to take down if someone uh, is behavior is not too good. And there's meals to get ready. On the other hand, there's loneliness. There's memories of loved ones that are no longer with us. The numbing silence of an empty house. The sadness seen in giggling children. When you could never have one yourself. Advent is to be a time of waiting. Not only to live into the tension of when the divine and creation collide. But it is the spiritual discipline of slowing down to notice God's presence in a still small voice in a violent and hurry world. Reminded in Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. But Marley is doomed to wander in constant aimless motion, like a shopper on Christmas Eve trying to find their last-minute gift. Marley offers Scrooge a warning echoing the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, for the rich man ignores Lazarus, the poor dying man who's at his gate, and would welcome many scraps but is offered nothing, and both die. Lazarus goes to heaven and the rich man is in hell. And there's a great chasm that separates them that neither one can cross. And the rich man wants Lazarus to bring water to him because he's in agony. And he insists that Lazarus should go to his brothers and warn them to change their ways so they don't end up in the same place of eternal torment. The rich man still sees Lazarus as a servant to do his bidding. He doesn't see Lazarus's value as a child of God. This parable offers a conviction to open our eyes to the value of each and every life. The rich man's torment is his own stubbornness in holding on to the misplaced idea that his life is more valuable than Lazarus's is. And that great chasm between Lazarus and the rich man was not wealth and it wasn't status. It was the Great chasm which the rich, rich man cannot travel, and it is ignorance. When we fail to see that class is a human construct built around the false belief that some souls are worth more than others, that chasm is impossible to cross. In a way, Marley, weighed down by the chains he forged in life, represented the rich man in Jesus' parable, affirming you reap what you sow, but warning Scrooge that he's been sowing the wrong kind of seed. Scrooge answers, But you were always a man, a, a good man of business, Jacob. And Marley answered, Business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. Marley can now see the plight of the poor, but he can do nothing about it other than to show it to Scrooge. If Marley's ghost were to visit you, what do you think you might say? But, you know, there's hope, because God's kingdom doesn't look like our kingdom. When Mary was pregnant with Jesus, she traveled to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And when they met, Mary offered a great vision of what God's kingdom looks like in the world. With all my heart, I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in my Savior. God has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. And God has come to the aid, aid of the servant Israel, remembering God's mercy, just as promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's dis descendants forever. During Advent, we remember Mary's vision of God's new creation coming into the world through Christ. It is a graceful world that we in which the proud are scattered, the hungry are filled, the lowly are lifted, and the helpless are offered a new life. The miracle has just begun in you, for the sake of the world. God bless us, everyone. Amen.
The light of the candle of hope goes before us, offering hope and healing to a darkened world. Go into the world confident in God's presence with you. And bring the words and actions of hope to all God's people. And the blessings of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.